Ah, my loyal specs. My name is Arcane Static, and welcome back to another bit of the story about Ark Survival Evolved. So we've gotten through the base game in the previous video. Now we're on to the Scorched Earth expansion, where Mei Yin and Nerva don't come along. But we've got two new characters as well, so let's dig right into this second part of the story. We start out with a character named Raya, an Egyptian priestess who gathers a small tribe and makes her camp in the shadow of the nearest obelisk in this desolate sandy desert. She's of the opinion that the obelisk is a representation of the gods she once worshipped in Egypt, and so she reveres that obelisk religiously. Her camp turns into a village, and sometime during that construction she is elected as de facto leader. The village starts to thrive and welcomes newcomers. Sometime after this village is built and starts to be successful, John Decaya, a half-Native American Old West-style robber, shows up and falls into his old habits. He and a couple other guys wrest the information that there's a settlement not too far away from some people that they end up robbing, and head towards that settlement with the intent to rob it blind as well. The settlement's gates are wide open and the guards are welcoming. John even meets Raya, who is fully leader now, and sees that in this world, nobody remembers his past as a brigand. He makes the decision to become a man of the law, and Raya sets him up as captain, because Raya didn't care for the nonsense word sheriff, of the city. He starts training his regiment of men to shoot and not be losers with guns, and their first chance to prove themselves comes at an attack by a group of dinosaurs that had cornered their hunting party, which they do handily at. Flash forward a bit to when John's men are pretty decent now, and Raya looks on bemused every time he trains them. Outside town, a water pipe breaks, and when some people go to fix it, they're ambushed by a group of these sort of semi-intelligent mantis monsters that apparently can manipulate tools and guns with their weird little hands. This is when the city learns that the mantis threat is not only real, but a thing. This is also when the city gets its name, Nosti. A caravan goes into town, ostensibly to trade goods with the townsfolk. Raya goes out to meet them, and the scene dramatically changes when they try to kidnap her and hold her for ransom. John will have none of that shit in his town, and handily kills every last one of them, including the one that surrendered out of fear. Raya protests that John shouldn't have killed the last one that surrendered, but John is a sort of no-mercy type of fellow when it comes to enforcing the law. As a result of this, Raya demands that John teaches her how to fire a gun properly. John reluctantly assents. Not long after, the town itself is attacked by the mantises in a sort of pincer-type attack pattern, and heavy losses are suffered. However, thanks to the training that John's men had gone through, they managed to defend the city from the invasion. This cements that Nosti will have to do something about the mantis threat, or else they will come back with more. John starts making a plan with the help of his lieutenant Sasha, a GRU agent, that's the like special forces in Russia, who specialized in explosives. Their plan is to track the mantises to their nest, go in, and blow it all sky high. Raya expresses worry about the danger of the plan, but her leadership skills shine as she puts down a bunch of civil revolt in town because of religious differences. It's here that we learn that Nasti is a free religion city, and that anyone can worship what they please. Cool place, that. With the explosives ready and the team prepared, John's men go onto the mantis nest and destroy it from the inside out. But in the process, John is gravely wounded by one of the mantises. Sasha brings John back to Nasti, and Raya stays by his bedside morning and night, even neglecting her duties as leader to tend his wounds. It's sort of a bit vague here, but this is when the two finally fall in love and become a thing together. Flash forward again, John has fully recovered, Raya is now a crack shot with a pistol but refuses to kill anything with it, and they're in a pretty good position with the city. One of Nasti's hunting parties goes missing, and through some tracking they find that it was a fire-spitting wyvern that took them down. Great, now they have to deal with wyverns. Well, not really, there are some bigger things on the horizon. One day the obelisk starts to thrum. Raya sees it as the pleasure of her gods, but John sees it as something dangerous. Guess who's correct about it? They have some petty squabbles over it, but not long after, the sky opens up and throws down lightning and earthquakes on the city of Nasti, killing everyone in it except for John and Raya, who managed to escape on a saber-toothed cat. Now that their city is destroyed, the two of them have to seek shelter. And hearing that there was some kind of settlement sighted some distance away one time, they go that direction. 
they find that not only is it a deserted and destroyed township, but also that it's full of those pesky wyverns that killed their hunting party. Raya and John hole up in one of the buildings there, but they gradually run out of supplies and are forced to make their move. The wyverns kill John, and Raya, in a fit of rage, kills every single one of them in retaliation, with her amazing accuracy. Raya mourns not only the loss of her husband, but the loss of her belief in the goodness of her gods as well. Bitterly, she comes across a clutch of wyvern eggs on the verge of hatching, and is about to destroy them out of revenge, when she suddenly stops. No, more ironic would it be if she raised them as her own. The very destructive power that killed her old life becomes her own to wield. She becomes a legend, a fairy tale. All of that whole thing happens before Helena and Rockwell ever even get to this arc, so here's where they come in. Back in the space station, we know that Helena gets transported, and then afterwards Rockwell does, but Rockwell arrives sometime before Helena does in the desert arc. The timeline between these two is a little bit convoluted for a while, but it stays separate enough that I'll tell them both as separate things until they cross. Let's start with Rockwell. Rockwell comes to the desert and wanders around the blazing heat for a while before he comes across a small settlement called Prophet's Rest, a superstitious township that reveres some kind of weird objects. He trades his services as a doctor for food and shelter, and sees that what they worship is the set of objects that would open an obelisk. He manages to steal their artifacts and escape into the desert at night, heading towards the obelisk that's further away rather than the closer one to throw them off his trail. On his way back to that obelisk, however, he's captured by the Burning Phoenix Clan, a warlike set of barbarians akin to the Huns from China. In an effort to get the opportunity to parley with their leader, he starts treating the wounded in his prison cell, and that gets the attention of the leader, who brings him to see his wife. The leader, Timur, demands that Rockwell help his wife Nazrin deliver her child, or he'll be killed. Rockwell is hardly an actual doctor, but he does his best, and the baby is delivered safely. Thanks to this highlight on his resume with the Burning Phoenix clan, Timur keeps him around, and Rockwell uses this opportunity to convince Timur that the obelisks are a thing that he should take interest in, there's some power behind them, and they travel to the obelisk and defeat its guardian using the artifacts that Rockwell had stolen from Prophet's Rest. Rockwell finds several samples of the metal with which he's so obsessed there, and scoops them all up to go back with the Burning Phoenixes, Phoenixes? To celebrate their victory. He then takes this opportunity to poison all of them, and I mean all of them, and then escape with the precious metal. Now, let's leave him here and go look to Helena. Helena appears in the desert and nearly dies of exposure, but is lucky enough to come across a group of travelers who help her to not die of exposure. In her first few days in the desert, it makes it clear that this Ark is a much more genetically free place than the island. Indeed, with the quote-unquote endless dunes that encircle the desert being filled with gigantic sandworms that could not possibly exist, the literal rock golems, and the flying, lightning-spitting wyverns that she comes across, this place would never have even given her the half-thought that it would have been a naturally occurring place. During a time when Helena witnesses an attack on a small village, she also witnesses is the Sky Rider, Wali al-Azwad, and her dragons that come to the assistance of the village. Almost hopefully, she calls out Mei Yin's name, but she gets no response. How sad is that? I wish we got more with Mei Yin. Anyway, the people there tell her that this Wali al-Azwad is a sort of boogeyman figure that comes only when people are in the greatest of need, decimates their enemies, and then disappears back into the sky. Helena finds a tiny fuzzball companion that acts as a sort of danger radar, for which she becomes thankful when it helps her stay out of trouble twice. She names it Radar, aptly. She keeps it with her for the rest of the story as a companion. Sometimes afterwards, Helena stumbles again across an actual permanent settlement that prevents her from dying yet again. During her stay in this village, she recalls the fond times she'd spent with Rockwell, and wonders if she could go back to the island and get him, bring him up to the space station for a cup of tea like old times. However, more importantly, a mantis evasion begins on the town, and Helena, who had just recently retrained herself to fire a gun, helps in defending the town. When things seem to be turning southward, Wali al Azwad shows up and, with her battalion of flying dragons, finishes off the Mantis troops and flies away. Just like Mei Yin, Helena wants to find where Wali lives and study her dragons. 
she manages to finally follow her long enough to see that she lives on the top of a treacherous mountain in the middle of the desert. She manages also, with great difficulty, to get to the top of the mountain, where she meets a laughing Wali. Wali tells Helena that she's been watching her since she arrived there, and Helena responds by sharing the information about the obelisks and space. Wally seems to be unsurprised to hear that the obelisks have such a function, curiously. Helena stays with Wally for a while while studying her wyverns, and in an effort to grow that relationship, Wally teaches Helena how to fly on them. It's during one of these flying sessions that Helena comes across Rockwell in the desert. Helena welcomes him with open arms and brings him back to Wally's house. Rockwell realizes that Helena has no idea he and Nerva were working together, and resolves to use that to his advantage. From this point onward, there seem to be kind of missing pieces of information, but here's what we do know. Wally also saw the portal that Rockwell came through before Helena's showed up, but did not get there in time to track whoever did come out of it. This means that the portals from the space station move people both in space and time. Rockwell has both the artifact from the Obelisk's Guardian and several samples of that miracle metal. Helena doesn't really care about the metal, and instead focuses on the artifact and the possibility of getting off the Ark. Rockwell lets Helena think that he's still just a doddering old scientist, and plans to use her to get back to the station where all that delicious metal is. Helena learns from Wally that there are two great cities that have been destroyed by the obelisks, and that the transporter cave is in one of them that Wally is a little bit reluctant to ever go back to. Helena leaves Radar with Wally, whom she now knows has a different name, Raya. Yes, that's right, Wally is Raya. Who didn't see that coming? They part ways, and Rockwell and Helena ostensibly go back to the space station. I feel like this skips a whole lot of things that had to happen in the middle there, but ostensibly they go back to that space station, and that's as far as we have now, but I guarantee there's going to be more when the next expansion is introduced. I wonder if we'll get more of Mei Yin and Nerva. I hope so. Mei Yin is like my favorite character in that game. Anyway, that's going to do it for this version of the story of Ark Survival Evolved. We'll have to wait until the next expansion comes out so that we get more explorer notes to hear more about what happens in that one. But thank you guys very much for listening. I hope that you've enjoyed it. If you have, the like and subscribe buttons are waiting just below this video. There's also some boxes you can click to get to more of my own videos, as well as a link to a Patreon that you can go to to help support me by giving me food so that I don't die to death. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.